the guys, the Lemonos, we decided, well, let's have one last beer together. So we went to the airport lounge to have a beer together. First thing the waitress does is ask for our IDs. And for all of you were thinking, pull out our IDs. She's kind of going, 20, 20, 20, 20, 19, 20, 20, 21. Okay, only one of you is of legal age. <laughs> only one of you can have a beer. And here we were, just spent a year in Nam, but yet when we came home, we weren't old enough to have a beer. My name is Royal Hetling, and I was assigned to the 43rd S Security Police Squadron stationed at Cameron Bay Air Base in 1970-71 to the K-9 unit. We were going to a security police tech school at the time, and they came in and said they needed 25 volunteers to go to dog school. And when the day for volunteering came, they put us in a large room and said that 25 people will volunteer. And I wound up being one of their 25 volunteers. And once you volunteered, they had you step into an adjacent room, and they had you sign a piece of note paper that stated, I volunteered. And then once you signed that, they said, you got the rest of the day off now. And everyone else stayed there until they got their 25th volunteer. And they did not get that 25th volunteer till rather late that afternoon. I wasn't exactly too eager right away at first because um, uh, everyone kind of knew what the situation was. And uh, I think I was volunteer number 16 or something like that. Once we finished that portion of our tech school training, we were then assigned to what was called the Department of Defense Dog Training Detachment at Lackland, where we went through 12 weeks of patrol dog training program. And we were about oh, halfway through that when we were told that uh, the majority of us would probably be going to Vietnam. And when the assignments came down, out of that 25 of us, 21 were given assignments to Vietnam. And 21 of us did go to Vietnam, and 11 of us were sent to Cameron Bay, where we were assigned to the 43rd SBS K-9 unit. We arrived there in August of 1970 on a Flying Tiger chartered air aircraft. When we arrived there in August, when the, when the plane landed, the, uh, we unloaded by, by service, branch of service. And when the buses rolled out next to the aircraft, one thing you noticed immediately was the windows on the buses, there was no glass in them, just chicken wire over the windows. And as each branch got off, they went to their uh, individual uh, reception centers. And for some odd reason, the Air Force was the last to go off. And one of the things you first noticed when they opened up the doors of that airplane was the heat and the humidity. It was unbearably hot and humid. And for some odd reason, we were the last people that they unloaded, us canine people. And we didn't know why at first until they came back and told us that um, we were in such short supply there that they needed us so badly that uh, they left us on base or left us on the plane to last because they said, uh, well, what we're going to do, take you off now. You go to your briefing. Once you get finished with your briefing, go pick up your baggage, go through customs, get your currency exchange. By that time, the truck will be here to take you over to your side of the base. You're going to skip all the other formalities. And by the time that was finished, our kennel truck was there waiting for us. The day kennel, kennelman was there and greeted us and uh, took us over to our east, what, what was referred to as the east side of the base. On our way over to the east side, the truck pulled over in front of what was called the Naval Air Facility. And he stopped there and he just said, in June, he pointed to a naval tower which is in the process of being rebuilt. And he said about 12 Vietcong sappers came out of that village and he pointed across the road to a little village, village we called Mika Village. He said 12 sappers came out of there, destroyed this guard shack over here and that observation tower, killed about three naval people and attacked that naval facility. And he said, um, this is what your tour is going to be like here. He said, I just want you to know what it's going to be like. And he says, and welcome to Vietnam because this is what you're going to see here. And he got back in his truck and we headed back over to the east side 
where you dropped us off at our orderly room and uh, they said, okay, leave us a copy of your orders. This is where you miss all of that. You will be processing in tomorrow morning at the CBPO Consolidated Base Personnel Office. They pointed us where that direction is. And he said, take them over to the billeting room office or the billeting quarters. You'll be staying at the Hilton Hotel uh, for the next few days, which was a large bill large bay billeting uh, quarters there. Um, once there, now we just climbed a bunk. And uh, then the following Monday morning, uh, we what reported to CBPO, started two days of in-processing in. Once that was completed, we went to a, a dental checkup, went to three days of in-country training, and were assigned our dogs. We went up to the kennels, got assigned to our dogs. Unfortunately, the first dog I was assigned to was a shepherd black lab mix named Pepper. Unfortunately, Pepper and I did not exactly get along too good. Whenever I tried to touch his uh, gate on his kettle, he would meet me with a lot of fur and teeth. And when I did manage to get a leash and muzzle on him, we would go down to the training area. I'd take the muzzle off, and he'd keep turning on me. Well, each time I would take evasive action and uh, to avoid from him biting me. And I just knew that for some odd reason, I just didn't think this was going to work. But my sergeant at the time kept saying, keep trying. You'll come around. Keep trying. Finally, a couple of days later, he um, told me, he says, don't take him out of the kennel. Here's some dog treats. Just play with him in his kennel today and uh, just get on his good side. So I said, okay. So I'm... He let me in his kennel run right away because he knew I had those dog treats. So I'm breaking those dog treats in little pieces, giving it to him a little piece at a time. And I'm down to my last little tidbit. I'm on the far end of his run. And I just gave him this last little bit. And I heard a little faint growl. And I thought, uh oh, I'm in trouble. And so I started working my way towards that gate. And all of a sudden, he had me. And it's a good thing, at what was very popular at the time was what they called an under-the-wrist watch. It was a watch, watch you wore under the wrist, had a wide band, and you had two buckles on the top side of your wrist. He came at me, and I saw those big four, big canine teeth coming, so I just shoved my wrist in his mouth. And he chomped down on, the, on that band, and the first chomp, he had that band completely off. And he was chomping down on my wrist while I'm trying to grab my other hand to get that gate open to get out. I got out, got the gate shut, and I looked at my wrist and he had uh, bitten me several times. And so I'm walking out of the kennel there, kind of holding my hand there, holding my arm there. And the day kennel man kind of walked over and said, he got you? I said, yep, he got me. He said, okay, let's go, go into the kennel office and get that treated. Well, Sergeant Emmett kind of looked at it and said, yep, okay, we better get you down to the dispensary. You got you pretty good there. I said, not until I get my watch back. So the kennelman had to go back in. We had to hose the kennel down. I stood on the outside. I caught my watch as it came out into the gutter. And so we got in the Jeep, and they took me down to the dispensary there. Right away, the medic said, okay. He said, this qualifies for the Purple Heart. I kind of looked at the medic there, and I said, oh, no, you got to be kidding me. He says, yeah, this qualifies for the Purple Heart. I said, no. Nah. I said, this is cheap. And he says, well, it's an open wound. You've been bleeding from it. This is a Purple Heart medal. I said, oh, you got to be kidding. Forget it. I says, don't, don't even write this up. I said, this is embarrassing. You're a dog handler and you get bit by your own dog? I said, I'm not going to live this one down. I said, forget it. And so he said, well, okay, if you insist. He said, we're not even going to document it. And I says, no, nah, don't. So anyway, I got a tetanus shot out of the deal, and they bandaged my wrist up. And by the time I got back to my hooch, right away it was all up and down canine room. Hey, here, that pepper got the new guy. Then uh, the kennel attendant says, well, don't feel too bad about it. You're only the eighth one he's betting. So then uh, that night, I had to go back up to the kennels again. My sergeant wasn't going to let me off the hook that easy. He said, well, you might as well get familiar with the posting situation around here. So you're going to ride around on the posting truck. So they said, uh, get on the truck that goes through the uh, POL area, which is the Petroleum Oil Lubrication Area, South Bay Area. So I rode around on that truck that night, getting acquainted with the posting procedures and how the posts were laid out. And we finished up. 
uh, shortly after dark and went walk back to my hooch and by that time I was in, in a permanent hooch then. And so remember just barely cl climbing to my bunk, just laying there, just kind of recapping my first week, what I went through my first week, yeah, you know, then processing in, you know, uh, getting my first dog, getting bit already and all this kind of good stuff and just laying there and all of a sudden I hear this loud explosion. I thought, ah, that, that, that didn't sound right. So I laid there, kind of listened a little bit more, then I heard a second explosion. He said, ah, no, I don't think that, that's normal. So I got up, started getting dressed, and all of a sudden the siren started going off. And I said, well, that is unusual. So I got dressed, and another guy in my hooch named Davenport, who was from Salt Lake City, who was off that night, came in the hooch, and he said, um, sappers have just hit the fuel dump. That's where I was just in about an hour or so earlier. And uh, in the process, he just said, uh, you know, he said, uh, the country sent you here to fight a war for him. Time has come for you to go out and start fighting it. So I walked out the front door of the hooch and kind of looked in the direction of the fuel dump, and uh, here it looked like the sun was starting to rise, and he saw this glow coming from a few tanks were now burning. And the sirens were now sounding over that, you know, your base is now under attack and telling everyone to take cover and, and all that kind of good stuff. At the end of Keenan Row, there was a row of conixes, you know, we could not keep a weapon with us in our hooch, but at the end of our row was a conix full of them. And so people were running to get to get a weapon like that to take up a defensive positions because this was a sapper attack now. So they didn't know where they were now. And so um, they're passing out weapons and ammunition uh, to everyone there now. And so um, they were dispersing people now. And so I was put on a bus headed out to where the main gate was. And I remember riding that um, bus going out to the gate thinking, you know, I rode on a school bus for 12 years going to public school here. Now I'm riding on a bus, possibly going to my first firefight with the BC. I thought, how, how ironic is this? So we get out to the gate, they drop us off, and they said, well, okay, you're going to take up a position here in this ditch. And just ahead of us, we could see where that fuel dump and those tanks that were burning there. And they said, um, they don't know what's, where they fled to, but just in the event they try and get into the main catonment area, which is where the base area, where the housing area was, take up positions in the ditch here. So we took up positions in the ditch here for the rest of the night. Then early in the morning, they threw... Um, about a half a dozen rocket rounds in us, uh, Chinese 107s on us. So that was kind of the highlight of that night. Then as the sun came up, they had us do a sweep around the POL area. And I remember walking around and looking at the um, fuel tanks here that had burned out, about uh, two or three tanks had burnt out that night, smaller tanks that they had blown up and destroyed. Then um, about a day or two later, I was reassigned to another dog named Thunder. We bonded almost immediately, and he was a real winner. So I finished my tour with Thunder, and uh, he was a really a champion dog. And uh, the story about canines in Vietnam, a lot of people don't realize that in 1965, the military brought 4,000 dogs to Vietnam under Operation Top Dog. And uh, they served mainly in three main roles. Roles were scouts, trackers, and sentries. Now the scouts and sentry dogs are mainly German shepherds because of their intelligence and adaptability to the heat and humidity. The trackers were Labrador retrievers because of their keen sense of smell. Now the trackers, they would go out with the infantry units once when contact was made and they would track down the bad guys to see where they would into a village or into a tunnel. And usually with the tracker units, there'd be a visual tracker that would go with them to follow behind the combat tracker. And the visual tracker would be looking to see how many people would be in that party they were tracking, whether it's one, two, three, or how many. They'd look for visual signs. Now, the scout dog would be a German shepherd, and they would walk point in front of the infantry patrol, and they'd be looking for such things as booby traps, ambushes, and snipers, where they would relay that information back to the infantry unit to tell them that, hey, you know, we're about to walk into some pretty dangerous stuff here. Now, one thing that was nice about 
the scout dog, if there was a booby trap, especially if there was a tripwire, the scout dog's hearing was sensitive enough, he would sit down in advance because he there would always be hair moving over a tripwire. His hearing was sense enough. He could hear that wind over that tripwire. So he would sit down and usually you would be within a one to two feet of that tripwire. So that dog would sit down and the handler would stop right away and start looking, where's that tripwire? And once they found that, they would just back up covering the same tracks that they stepped in earlier so, so they could neutralize that threat. And the sentry dog, which I was, which Thunder was, was the sentry dog, we would go out at night from the time the sun went down to the time the sun came up in the morning. And we would secure such things as camp perimeters, fuel dumps, bomb dumps, munitions dumps, or any target that was considered to be of high priority that the BC would attempt, would likely try and destroy. And unfor unfortunately, Cameron Bay was one of the areas of main point of entry, port of entries. Uh, just south of us, what they call South Beach, was a natural harbor. So it was a main port of entry for both material and base itself was a main port of entry for m people coming in. So it was a prime target. And the year before we got there, the Bia Kong moved two sapper battalions into our area just for training to conduct operations against us. In 1969, they moved two sapper battalions into our, into our area to conduct training and to conduct operations against us. So when we go out at night, there are certain areas that we were constantly being probed in. What I mean by being probed, your dog would alert and you would not find any sign of any logical explanation as to why your dog was alerting. Now for Thunder, his alerts were rather obvious. In a dog pants, when he pants, that's his way of cooling himself. Now for Thunder, he would stop panting and he stick his nose up in the air slightly to elevate and he perches his, he perches his ears slightly forward. That's his alert. And he's he like, he kind of stare forward. But what I will do then, I look between his ears and sight down his nose to see where he's looking. Now this is night. So you see nothing but darkness and shadows. So you don't focus your eye on any one object because you will not see nothing. So you keep your eyes searching, scanning. Don't focus on anything. Keep scanning. And always start out far ahead of you and work close to you. And look at your dog's body language. Now, Thunder, if it was closer to me, his alert would be a little different. If it was getting closer to me, he'd give me that quick look. Then I knew whoever that was there was closer to me than what I thought. If he let out a faint growl, then I knew he was almost right on top of me. That's how I would judge the distance. Then I knew where to start looking. Now as to the numbers, I'd always start out with an arbitrary number and I always start out with 20. I'd say 20, no. 16, no. 12, no. 9, no. 6, no. 3, no. 1, okay, probably 1. If it's a lone one, this guy is out there. He's probably just in to try and collect some type of information or intelligence about us. If it was three or more, you have to remember that they like to come in cells of three. What they wanted to do was come across in maybe a group of maybe six or nine. But whenever they did, they break down into cells of three and come at you from different directions of three man cells. So he always had in mind that, you know, it was going to be between one and three. So when it was just one, you kind of knew that, okay, this guy is just what I call, he was just there to stay and play with you. And so you kind of had to keep that in mind. So it was always a kind of like a psychological mind game. You had to kind of play with them. Now, what I would do when we were there, they would like to have you walk a constant patrol to your assigned area. Uh, usually if it was along a fence line or along a tree line, they would prefer that uh, you walk a constant, like walking a beat, whatever, but they'd always say, change your routine. What I found best is that Victor Charlie, he knows you're there. 
why do you want to make yourself that visible tool? I like darkness and shadows. He likes darkness and shadows and cover. So I tried to adopt as much of his tactics as I could to myself. So when I got out to my assigned area, the first thing I would do, I'd walk from one end to the other end like what they wanted me to do. What I'd be doing then is I would be assessing what's my environmental conditions? What kind of cloud cover do I have? Um, uh, what kind of lighting conditions uh, is there tonight? How are the shadows falling? Um, what's, uh, uh, what's the wind direction tonight? Because one thing for a sentry handler is you want to take in what is your wind direction? And the best way to feel that is in your face. So one thing we never wore a hat, and this is what a lot of people said, well, where's your helmet? Where's your hat? We said we'd never wear it because we always wanted to feel that wind in our face. And once I walked from one point to the other end, I'd be always asking myself, now, if I was Mr. Victor Charlie, if I was going to come through here, where would I choose to come through? And I'd pick out a spot that I thought I would pick. Then I would go back into the woods, go, I'd pick out maybe 30 or 50 yards back in the woods, and I would backtrack. That's what we call quartering. I would backtrack just to make sure that it was clear. Then I would proceed to the spot which I thought was best for me to stay, you know, for the night, which would offer me the best cover and concealment, which was the most dark and the very with the most shadows. And I would get into it. Now, we always carried a small two-way radio with us. Well, small at the time, but rather big by today's standards. I would turn the volume of that radio down so low I could just barely hear it myself. For the simple fact, I did not want no one else to hear it. I did not want no one else to, did not want the radio to give me away. So I turned that volume down so low I could just barely hear it myself. And once I got to my spot, I'd always pick out a spot where I could see my area as much of it as I could. Then I'd try and stay in it, minimize my movements. And if I moved, I tried to move no more than what my shadows would permit me to move. And if I did move, I tried to stay within the sh boundaries of the shadows would permit me to. And so then I would try to move around like that the entire night. And many of your nights would pass without incident. Some of your nights were just the opposite. Some nights uh, the stress level would be rather high because, you know, your dog would be alerting. That's when you kind of know, okay, now it's the mind game. Now he's not playing with me. He knows I'm here somewhere. Now let him try and figure out where I'm at. And uh, so that that's that's the mind game starts playing in there. And uh, so that's that's where the stress level starts rising. Other nights, the stress level gets really high. In fact, in one night in particular, I'm going to recall here very quickly. I was posted on position on what we call area on the North Bay. There was trip flares going off in the wire about every hour, hour and a half, the entire night. I wasn't calling them in, but we had a tower gunner who was calling him in. Central Security was calling me then and saying, do you confirm that trip flare burning? And I'd say, yes, I do. Then they'd always say, can you investigate as to why did that trip flare go off? And I'd say, yep, okay, I will. So I go down, I look at it, and we had what we call a SAT team, security alert team. If you could not verify why that went off, you were to call them, that was your next chain up. And so I call them and they come and they say, well, an animal set it off. Well, you really wouldn't argue with them too much because, you know, they were kind of set in their ways and you did not want to really argue too much with them because no matter what you said, it wasn't going to make any difference. So you'd say, okay, well, whatever. And they go on their merry way and you go back to where you were. Well, an hour later, another trip flare went off. You play the, do the same routine again. Okay, fine. Hour later, another trip flare. That went off the entire night. Okay, just as the first streaks of sun is coming up, the last flare goes off. You go through this routine again. Okay, you're down there. You're looking at it. It's up this time. You see in the sand, there's an area in the sand that looks like it's been sl lightly swept with something like about a foot and a half wide, or a foot and a half long, but a foot wide, like it's been lightly brushed. It's got a different wear pattern and area around it. You're looking at that and you're saying, 
Okay, this looks a little odd here. So you call for the SAT team again. Now this time they're getting a little annoyed with you for calling them about every hour now for this. They arrive, the sergeant gets out of his jeep, looks at you, and he's looking a little peeled at you. He's an animal. And you're just saying, oh, hold on a minute here, sergeant. You better look at this. I, I, I just don't think this is an animal here. They said, this is in the wire here. And I said, no, there's no tracks here. Animals can leave tracks. There's no tracks here. And he said, he just looks at me. He said, it's an animal and don't you question it. And I kind of look, was trying to get him to look at it. saying, so look, look, better look at this. Call it undecided. Well, he kind of gives me this. If you know it's good for you, look, you know, you shut your mouth. So he calls it in as an animal. Okay, sun's coming up. We're all going to be out of here shortly. I, you know, what do I care at this point? Following night, they come through. Well, they kill a couple of them there. Well, that particular night, Emerald Armando up on the far end. We were being probed pretty heavily there that night. Or earlier in the year, we were being probed pretty heavy. We have no support. They've taken all of our backup. They moved that way. Okay, I'm on a post that is heavily overgrown with brush on both sides. And you've got no backup now. They've taken everything from you. And you get a call from Central Security. They want you constantly patrolling your area. You just look at your area and you just say, okay, if they intend to blow this down tonight, I'm on an area where either they're going to be passing by me, either coming or going, entering or leaving. They've got to come through me. This is probably one of the areas they're going to come through. And you just kneel down by your dog you can just kneel down by Thunder and you just talk to him and say, Thunder, if you can just give me one second. Just give me one second. That's all I need is one second. And you just pet him a little bit and tell him what a good dog he is. And you just stand up and you check your rifle over again just to make sure that that's working okay. Check the magazine. You know, you feel that spring in the bottom, you know. Reload that magazine in it. And then you put a chamber in the round. And then you put your selector to full automatic. As you know that if they're going to come through there, you're not going to have any time to get any radio message off or anything like that. The only way you're going to be able to warn anybody is see how long you can hold your finger on that trigger. And so then you just start walking down that narrow lane and your mouth is so dry you can't swallow. Your heart is not beating in your chest, it's pounding in your chest. And you're trying your darndest to walk on air. And once you reach the other end of your area into the clearing, you see the you reflection of your own shadow and you darn you empty a clip into it. That's how tense you are. But you catch yourself just short of doing it. Then you look and you just say, God, you know, I'm way out over here. Everyone else is way back over there. My only way to get back over there to wherever anyone else is, I got to go back down that same lane again. So you go back to the same emotion again, going back down that lane again, thinking, well, they weren't there the first time. You may be there this time. So you go back through that again. Well, you make it through there the first time. When you get back there, now they tell you, keep going, got to keep doing it. For the next several hours, you're doing that. Well, it turns out that you were okay that night. Nothing happened that night. It was all over where you were the night before. But you come in in the morning, you uh, climb into your bunk. You really don't sleep good because you're just so wound up yet. You uh, get up. You head to the latrine. You look at yourself in the mirror and you see a face that's totally void of all emotion. It's just got a blank look on his face. And you, you don't see a 19-year-old kid anymore. You just look at a face that looks like he's 40 years old now all of a sudden. This looks like he's aged that much in one night. And that's just the way one night went. And so you have nights like that. But then you have a lot of nights, so too, where nothing happens. It's just, just routine nights where nothing happens. But then you have nights where you uh, go out there, and uh, all of a sudden you just get this feeling in your gut that, you know, I'm not alone out here. There's somebody else out here. And he's watching me. 
but where is he out here? So you try every trick in your book that you know of to flush this guy out, and you're not finding anything, and your dog is not alerting. And you keep what you call cording again, and you're not finding anything, and you're going getting down to an area which we you know, really don't want to get into because we do a lot of H&I fire harassment and interdiction fire, and you know there's going to be some unexploded ordnance down there. So you don't want to be stepping on that because it would be just my luck I would find it. So you get down into those gray areas which you don't want to get down into. You get out that far. So you kind of pull yourself back up. And there's a bee out in front of us, in front of me there that night. And uh, so I kept thinking there that, ah, you know, this feeling is just not going away. But this feeling is there that there's something there where he's watching me. And uh, so you get nights like that where it just don't go away. So then finally, you see the first streaks of sun coming up in the morning. You're just thinking, it's, uh, there was nobody there. It was just me and my imagination. So if you just sit yourself down on a little bit of a sand dune there, and you're just starting to recap the night a little bit, and you're just kind of petting your dog there a little bit. And uh, the tower gunner, just uh, north of you a little bit, he gets on his radio and he says, uh, he's calling for a mortar flare to be put up because he thought he saw something moving down there where you just were walking just a minute or two before. So right away you're just thinking, ah, he just saw me down there. And he's just, just said, thought, um, precaution, I'll just have a flare put up just to be sure. So you're not putting too much uh, uh, importance on it. So you just stand up and you're just kind of watching and you, you you hear that flare passing overhead and you know motor rounds you you hear them going coming overhead you know then you hear this flare ignite open up and the area illuminates and guess what jumps up one of them jumps up and he runs out into the channel and you just stand there and you just look and goes doggone it there he goes he, all you do is just stand in point there he goes and that's after didn't even hardly made a ripple as you ran out into the channel and I kind of looked down at Thunder there, there, and he just kind of looked at me up at me, and he says, just like if you could read a dog's mind, I didn't know he was there either. So you got to give those guys, the Viet Cong, we are referring to, credit. They were very elusive. In fact, um, we actually found at one point um, that they were actually rubbing their bodies down with animal fat, which deadened the human scent, as we trained our dogs to alert on the human scent, not the animal scent. And so we actually found that out on one of the bodies that they left behind, that they found the ammo fat on them. And so at times before that they had actually dropped stink bombs, stuff like that, to follow up the dog scent. So we found it hard to, to, uh, to trail them. A um, lot of times when they throw a strong alert, we would be trailing them. We go by both ground scent, you know, tracking, and airborne scent, or vice versa, or they would alternate. As there would be times that uh, they would alert, We'd be following the uh, airborne scent. Then it'd be a 90 degree turn, like maybe 50, 100 yards, be 90 degree turn, and we'd be tracking. Then be another 90 degree turn. Now we're going by airborne scent. Then another 90 degree turn. Now we're tracking again. Now then another 90 degree turn, airborne scent. So we'd see a lot of turns like that. So we knew we were following a human there, not an animal, because an animal would not make sharp 90 degree turns like that all the time. So we knew that was human. So, but those people, you got to give them credit. They could blend into the underbrush like you wouldn't believe. And uh, they were masters at doing it. And I know there was nights uh, that thunder would alert. And I'd start following their alert. And I'd be lucky if I even saw a brush hardly move. And I knew they were there. And occasionally I'd see maybe some brush moving, wiggling in front of me. That'd be about it. And uh, so that's all how, how proficient they were. When I talk about a sapper, you know, a sapper is a, a vehicle that's very proficient in evasion techniques and in penetration techniques and in demolition. He had a lot of training in it. He wasn't your run of the mill vehicle. This guy was highly trained and very proficient in, in those areas. So he knew what he was doing. And usually when these people come ashore, they would usually be dressed in maybe a swimming trunks or a loincloth, something like that. So they were very, um, very, uh, uh, very agile and uh, like that. And weaponry, 
They'd either carry a Chinese-made 9mm pistol, or maybe just a knife. That's what all they'd be armed with, and the rest of what they carried would be uh, their explosive, explosive devices. So, but uh, we got to give those guys credit. They were very good at what they were doing. Unfortunately for us, we were along the coast. So we were hampered in quite a few ways. The uh, population was moved from inland to along the coast, so that we had an ever-growing population of civilian population. And we had the ocean on one side of us and the bay on the other side. So whenever they did stage a successful attack against us, they would always flood the waterways with their sandpans. And with their sandpans, they fill them with women and children. They knew when the Viet Cong fled our base, they would blend in, they would climb aboard these sandpans and blend in with the civilian population. They knew we would not fire upon them. So they knew they had, they'd say, they had a safe getaway. We knew that that would be adverse publicity for us if we fired upon them. So a lot of times we would just watch them get away. There's nothing we could do about them. And to top it off, a lot of times we had to get permission from the local public officials before we could even do anything either. And in a lot of cases, the public officials were sympathetic to the Viet, Viet Cong cause. To backtrack here a little bit, about a month after we got there, myself and a couple of the guys that came there with, were sitting in our hooch one day, and we were reminiscing about our first month in country, about what we had observed and versus of what we had uh, kind of led to believe, you know, uh, stateside here. And uh, we were kind of sharing our, reminiscing, sharing our thoughts one day. And we had uh, Vietnamese maids there kind of doing our uh, daily housekeeping chores, stuff like that. And there was an older gal there. She was listening into our conversation. And we asked her to sit down with us and join us in our conversation. And we asked her, what did she think about us being here in, in their country? And uh, she looked at us and she said, why are you here? And we just simply asked her, she said, um, we told her to um, free yourselves from the Viet Cong, that they're communists and that they want to take over your country. And we're trying to free yourself from that so you can live, a, live the way you want to live. And she looked at us and she said, what's a communist? So we tried to explain to her what a communist was, which simply went over her head. And she said, uh, you talk a lot about Viet Cong. She said, do you know what one looks like when you see one? And we said, oh, yeah, yeah, we would spot BC ones when we saw one. She said, describe one to me. So here we are, we are describing what we thought a typical VC would look like. When it got done, she just looked at us and she said, don't we all look that way to you? And we just kind of shrugged our shoulders and said, oh, yeah, you know, some way, yeah, yeah. Guess you all do. And bear in mind, this was an older gal. So she was there when the French were there about 15 years prior to us being there. So she worked for the French. And she told us that she said, you know, you're not much different from the French when they were here, except that you speak a different language. But she said, you're no different than them. And she said, um, when you talk about Viet Cong, and I said, uh, she said, you know, basically she said, what are Viet Cong? And without us knowing it, we literally described the Hollywood version to her, what we thought a Hollywood version of Viet Cong would look like. And she said, follow me. So she got up and we went outside behind her hooch and all the young ladies were leaving that day, going back to the pickup point to, to take them back off base. And a lot of them were walking by us and they're smiling and they're waving to us, nice and friendly like. And so we're all smiling, waving back to them, nice and friendly like, you know, like what we're supposed to be like. And she said, look around. And she said, uh, tell me how many Viet Cong do you see here? And uh, we just were looking around and finally we said, no, we don't see any Viet Cong here because we're thinking we're going to see someone who's going to look real mean at you and they're like, oh, you ugly American, you know, like that. We didn't see any of them like that. And we said, no, nah, nobody. And uh, she said, really? She said, you say you don't see any, any VC here? And we all said, no, nope, not a one. She said, really? She said, as we speak right here, she said, they're all around you. 
And we just kind of stood there looking at her and not really knowing what to say. And finally one person just said, what should we be doing? And without even hesitating, she said, go back to America and leave us alone. And one guy just said, why? She said, you don't know nothing about us. This is the way we, this is life for us. Nothing's going to change for us. Nothing you do here is going to change anything for us. She said, this is just the way it is. She said, the longer you stay here, this more you're going to die here. And with that, she just picked up her meager belongings, turned around and walked away from us and just left us standing there. And uh, never forget that conversation. With Thunder, I always viewed him as being my dog. He wasn't the person who had him before me, and he wasn't the person that took him over after me. He was mine. And uh, the person before me, he just kept him till I got there. And the person after me, he just held him till that was it, you know. But he, Thunder was, he was my dog, nobody else's dog. He was mine. And I guess that's the way I will always remember him as that. Unfortunately, uh, in a hurry to get out that um, United States, well, I don't know if I said this earlier, but... Uh, out of those 4,000 dogs that were brought there, 350 of them, uh, they feel were killed in combat. Another 500 died from disease and other causes. And in our hurry to get out, they only brought 204 out. And the rest, they gave the veterinarians and vet techs just two options. Either turn them over to the South Vietnamese military where they faced an uncertain fate where dog meat is a delicacy to them, or they were to be destroyed. And unfortunately, or whichever, Thunder was ordered to be destroyed about a year after I left, which probably was probably the better end of the deal for them. Um, the person that handled him after me, uh, he called me here last fall and said that um, the day that uh, Thunder was to be, be turned over, to the South Vietnamese. Uh, they were up at the kennels and he took Thunder out of his run and he handed the leash to the Armand soldier and Thunder literally pounced all over him, knocked him down to the ground and was on top of him. And at that point they said, nope, that uh, they could not be turned over. So then he was ordered to be destroyed. So he was destroyed right after that. So, you know, I, I think that's probably the only reason why I'm here today. Because uh, I do think there's times that, um, I, I do think that uh, that's the only reason I survived is because of him. Because uh, doing what I did there without a dog, I, I don't think I'd be here today. But one one funny story there, if you want to call it funny here. Um, I was there probably about a month or so. And I was back, way, way back. Uh, I was supposed to be kind of securing part of the control tower and part of a part to your ramp. And we came under a rocket attack that night. And uh, you're still a fairly new country there. So this is still, you're still part of that learning curve. You know, you're kind of learning how things do. And I'm starting to watch the rounds coming in. You know, they're coming in, I'm kind of watching them. They're coming in a little closer and closer and a little closer. Finally, it dawns on you that, hey, you know, these things are getting a little closer. I should think about getting cover, taking cover here. So in your... Um, inexperience here you kind of look around real quick you know where's my best cover and there's a lot of sand the sand blows around like soldiers here to do and i saw a little a tr small tree and there's a like a little crater that formed around that tree so i thought ah oh, there's good cover for me it was about 20 feet away from me so i covered in about two or three steps and i dove in behind it you're down inside there and as i picked my head up here, I saw my rifle. I firmly planted the muzzle in the sand. And I quickly pulled it out, and I had plugged the muzzle with sand. So I had to quickly break it down and put my cleaning rod through it to clear the sand out. And I reloaded it again. I fought myself down on the sand, thinking, okay, here they are, BC, where are you? They're coming, you're thinking they're coming. And all this time, here's Thunder standing on top of the sand dude, just looking at me. And if you could read a dog's mind, like he's standing there saying, where do they get this guy from? 
Man, I got my hands full. If I could look out for him this entire year here, yeah, I got my my balls full, you know. <laughs> you know, if you could, you could read a dog's mind, you could see that, that's what was going through his mind. <laughs> Just like, oh, this is no big deal. Look at him when he's reacting to this, you know. <laughs> but, but there's another night I remember this one. Uh, this wasn't, believe me, this was not funny at the time, but there's a degree of humor in it now. We had a couple of posts right in front of the Naval Air Facilities and uh, between that and Mika Village. And uh, they had sprayed that area, must have sprayed with A. George real good because there was nothing growing. And so whenever we would go out there, we'd always ask ourselves, who do you feel more secure with, the village or the Navy people? A lot of times we'd say, okay, let's, let's try the village. So we, you were either going to be fully exposed to the village or the Navy people. A lot of times we would go on the downside of the slope so we'd be fully exposed to the village well we were starting to get reports that the navy was telling us that they were getting sniper fire out of that village so there's one night i thought okay if they're really getting sniper fire from that village i don't want to be fully exposed to that village but i really don't want to be fully exposed to the navy people here too because now they're going to be jumpy on on the trigger too so I found a crater, impact crater from a rock artillery around, and I landed there. So I dug some old driftwood, deadwood over, dropped it down behind me, gave myself just a little more cover from the Navy people. And I crawled into this crater, and I could kind of see in front of me, the village in front of me. If I stick my head up behind me, I could see the tower gunners behind me. So I thought, okay, this will be good back here. So we're sitting in this little crater, just about the entire night. And finally, you know, my legs started to ache. I thought, God, I got to stand up and stretch you. You know, I can't take this any longer. So I said, I'm going to chance it. So I stand up. All of a sudden, your two machine gun bolts snap forward, M60s. I thought, oh, crap. First thing that goes through my mind is, okay, if there's ever a time to do something thoroughly stupid, this is not it. So I'm standing there, I'm kind of waving to these guys saying, hey guys, you know, don't worry about me. I'm on your side, guys. You know, don't get trigger happy here. So I'm telling Thunder, hey Thunder, come on up here, let them see you. Come on, come on, be a good boy. Come on up here, let them see you. And he's standing down there in that little crater looking up at me saying, you know, my hearing is better than yours and I heard those two M60 balls go forward. Do you think I'm dumb enough to stand up there like you? <laughs> <laughs> and I knew the second I dropped down in that crater, those two balls, those two machine guns are going to open up. So I kept standing there, kind of waving at him. Finally, I said, come on, Thunder, get up here, you know, get up here. And finally, he wouldn't get up there. So finally, I got walked clear out of that crater, and he had to come with me. And finally, they could see who I was. And I just kind of stayed up there for a minute or two. Then I got back down to the crater, and I didn't get out of there until the sun came up. So when I went to the relief point, which was back at the gate shack for the naval facility there, the entry point there, their guard came out and said, was that you who got up there about 3 o'clock this morning? I said, yeah, I had to stretch my legs there. I said, I couldn't take it anymore. He said, you know, our two tower gunners said, uh, permission to open fire on you? I said, yeah. I said, I heard those two bolts go forward, 60 bolts go forward. I thought, oh, crap, I'm in trouble now. He said, yep, they had ordered, they, had to, they were given permission to open up on you. I said, yeah. and I said, well, why didn't they? He said, because I got on my radio told me you better double check first to make sure there's some guy walking his dog first. <laughs> so I said, thanks. I said, always got to make sure of that because we're out there. But yeah, yeah, he wasn't a dumb dog, that's for sure. He was a smart one. And so, but yeah, that's just one of those little funny stories there that you think about later that he was standing down on that little creator just looking up at me saying, yeah, if you're dumb enough to stand up there, you know, I'm, I'll stay down here, you know. The military really did not keep a lot of detailed information. And so even a lot of the numbers I gave to you, they just, they're estimations. They just estimated 350 dogs were killed in combat, and they estimated another 500 died from other causes. In fact, they also further estimated that dogs saved an estimated over 10,000 American lives and prevented over 75,000 wounded. Those are just estimated. And uh, then, too, I've also seen the numbers go as high as 17,000 lives they saved. 
So um, there is no hard or true answer either way. You know, those are just estimations. So it's how a person wants to interpret the numbers. I think people uh, uh, value their service now more than what they did back then. Because back then they were actually determined to be equipment. And that's why they were declared surplus uh, animals back then because they were classified as equipment. That's why they were so easily written off. Where now that they're de determined to be more valuable, uh, more valuable as a, as a service animal now, their value is actually placed uh, equal to that as a person now. So, so I don't know if I said this earlier, but before the military, when the service life was over with, they were destroyed. Now, they're put up for adoption. So that if you want to adopt one, you can. But you have to be vetted as if you're going to adopt a person, a child. You go through the same procedure. And once a dog is available, and once you've been approved, you can adopt one. I think the first use of dogs actually started back in World War I. And I don't think it was really, I think it was more incidental. I don't exactly know the exact history, but I think it was more incidental. It was a dog named Stubby, I believe. You start more as a pet, and then it turned out that the pet found, found to have some uh, military value by uh, accidental contact. Then during World War II, these saw some value with dogs during the World War II, the Doberman Pinscher, especially in the uh, South Pacific Islands, uh, the military used them. Then in Korea, they used them more so than Vietnam, more so too. Over the years, uh, talk with other Vietnam vets, I always got the sense that there was a need for closure, that they, a lot of them were lacking that uh, closure because of the anti-war protests. Because um, when I came back, the public, the country was divided right down the middle, and you didn't want to talk about it for the simple fact that you did not know the person that you were talking to, what their opinion of it was. And so you never, you never brought the subject up. And so in 2006, the city was having the 125th anniversary. So I thought what would be a good event for that was to bring the traveling wall here. So about eight years prior to it, I started talking about people about, you know, could we raise funds to do that? And uh, I said, it's going to take quite an effort. And it's going to take a fair amount of change, money-wise, to do that. And it really was not a well-received idea at first, because mainly for the uh, money-wise, because people thought that was just too ambitious of a project, and uh, they thought it was just going to hurt other causes and uh, every reason whatsoever. But um, I just felt that, you know, give them time and give them some planning and, you know, give them a little hard work that, you know, we could do what I just felt. I felt we could do it. So... I went around and kept talking to people and kept kind of trying to encourage people that we needed to do something to bring closure. And I kept talking and kept trying to promote it. And slowly but surely, the idea did kind of catch on. And with a little help from the, from a few organizations and a few entities, you know, it did catch on. And we did show people that, you know, there was a few of us who were willing to work. We weren't afraid to work and we were not interested in handouts all the time that we were willing to work for, put on activities, you know, social activities, and that we were willing to accept funds, you know, if you're willing to donate, fine, you know, if not, we were willing to work, for, and put, act, put on burger feeds, and whatever, uh, to raise money, and uh, that uh, we're willing, this is the goal we wanted to do. So in 2006, we had the traveling wall here, which was a half-size Vietnam Memorial for the Vietnam Memorials Fund, which is, uh, what the wall in DC is a part of. And when it was here, we estimated that about 10,000 people come to town that weekend to see it here. And we put on an opening ceremony in the high school that Thursday night. And the people were commenting afterwards that um, this was probably one of the better events that ever occurred here in town. That uh, a lot of people were commenting that uh, when was the last time an event that good was ever held here? Well, afterwards, or even before that part of the planning, I wanted to do something to remember those guys who did not come home. 
because these guys were my generation. Some of these guys I grew up with. In fact, like Don Kalsha, I stepped on his foot on the junior senior prom. I was a waiter for it, and I stepped on his foot in the school cafeteria because it was so crowded in there. I remember Don looking at me, telling me, you know, Royal, that hurt. <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah, I know, Don. <laughs> but I didn't mean to. But, you know, I remember that. And he was a FFA chapter president. And, you know, those are the memories I have of these, some of these people. And uh, so I just did not want their names just to become a name on a bulletin board and nothing more about them. They, I wanted these people to be remembered as to who they were. And so I, I, I just said, we got to do something more than just that. And so when the event came and left, I said, okay, it's over. But now we've got, we've got to do something more here now. And so I didn't know what to do here. And uh, so Charlie kind of had this idea here, you know, about doing this and memorializing them here too. But he kind of wanted to go much more than just remembering them. He wanted to cover more of the history of how we got involved there and, and, and tell people the story of Vietnam, what all happened there. So this is actually a product of uh, bringing the wall here and, and uh, how, how this whole process came about. So as you can see here, there's quite a collection here of, of the memorial section behind me here, remembering these people who did not come home. Uh, over here in the side, a little dog set up here, a tribute you know, to what dog teams did there. And then back here, we have a little Viet Cong se section set up back there where we have actually a mannequin of a lady, a uh, Viet Cong woman's uniform there. Uh, you know, a timeline showing how did the U.S. actually get involved there. So a person wants to come in and browse, they can browse for some time here. Um, some people come in and they'll tell us that uh, they've learned more than what they've ever known before. In fact, uh, we've had some high school students come in that said they'll learn more in one hour in here than what they learn in a week in the classroom. So we get a variety of uh, feedback. So hopefully this will continue and hopefully people will continue to come in. So, but hopefully it'll be around for years to come. We know we won't be, but hopefully it will be. So we hope there'll be a legacy here somewhere. Uh, just how or what, we don't know yet. So we're working on it. What I would like to do here eventually is, I'd like to get a German Shepherd dog here, replace my garden variety statue here. But I know that's a little difficult there because when I talk to vet clinics and humane societies for a possible donation there, uh, you know, you're talking about a family pet, family member. Uh, yeah, I know how that is. But someday I hope someone will think, okay, that's to remember what dog teams did back then. So it's, it's a tribute. So hopefully maybe someday something will, will happen. But in the meantime, I tell them, use your imagination. Think about that being a, a real dog there. Getting down to the end of July here. Actually, I contemplated extending for another tour now. But when I told the folks about that, they told they came on glued. And because uh, uh, I kind of felt somewhat comfortable, if you want to use that term, comfortable. And I didn't know if I, you know, would feel that way stateside. And they kind of, they laid a guilt trip on me that I couldn't handle. I was a bad kid and all that kind of good stuff. How could I do this to them? Now you're a terrible kid. You know, you, you know, they got all this, you know, this disappointment through them and all that, be, you know, all that you're a bad kid type of stuff, you know, all that kind of good stuff. So I chose the Nero's. So I got about three weeks left. I'm out and that bomb dealt. And the SAT team came around and the machine got her on it. And he was just sitting back in his Jeep saying, yep, he says, my last night, I got to go out being relieved in the morning, going home next Wednesday. And I said, oh, really? And I said, nah, I said, I'm not far behind you. I told him I had like, what, 28 more days or something like that left. He looked at me and says, oh, you're in the group going home in August? I said, yep. He says, no, you're not. We said, what do you mean? He said, you're going home next Wednesday with me. I'm standing there saying, oh, yeah, sure. Tell me all about it. He says, no, no, you're, you're going home next, next Wednesday with me. I said, I got my orders. And I said, I'm going home in August. He said, no, you're going home next Wednesday with me. And I said, ah, no, no. I said, uh, my orders are in August. So I said, until I see otherwise, I, said, I got 28 more days left or whatever it was. So two more days pass. It's now Saturday morning. We come in. And I'm about ready to climb into my bunk. 
another guy from Lincoln, Nebraska, comes in our ooch and he says, Hey, have you heard anything about us going home on Wednesday? I thought, oh, God, he got that rumor started. The guy's name is George. I said, ah, oh, George, I heard that a couple of days ago. Forget it. It's a rumor. He said, he said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, I said, forget it. I said, look at all the other rumors we've heard around here. I said, none of them have been true yet, so why would this one be true? I said, we got our orders. We're going home next in August. So I said, forget it. And they said, oh, yeah, you're probably right. I said, until you see it on writing out paper, I said, it's just a rumor. Forget it. So, okay. Uh, we all, I called in my bunk, went to sleep. A couple hours later, I wake up. There's some partying going on outside. One of the guys, Steve, comes in and starts shaking me in my bunk. He says, get up. We're going home Wednesday. I rolled over. I said, Steve, I said, I told you earlier, it's a rumor. Forget it. Let me get some sleep. I roll back over to go back to sleep again. He comes back in, pulls me out of my bunk, and drops me on the floor. I thought, ah, that did it. So I get up and the fight, you know, I was going to physically remove Steve from my side of the hooch since I was bigger than Steve. As I'm picking myself off the floor, he's holding this piece of paper in front of my face. He says, read this. We're going home Wednesday. So I take the piece of paper out of his hand. I'm kind of holding it up, reading it. The following people, 43rd SPS, K-9 unit, effectively relieved 0 7 3 hours this day. Proceed, proceed to uh, um, process all, you know, for transportation uh, to Conus on, on the following Wednesday, and all our names listed below it. I says, Steve, we're going home Wednesday. Handed this paper back, and Steve standing there saying, what do you think I've been trying to tell you? So, <laughs> had to get dressed and go and join the party. So, yeah, they cut us short by three weeks. But I don't know if you want to include this or not, but uh, when we, uh, Got to Seattle, and we couldn't write home because we'd get home before the letters would get home. Got to Seattle to the airport there. I tried to call home. The old party lane, remember what the old party lane was? Well, I got the busy signal the first few times. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, when we were gone, they changed the phone numbers from the four-digit numbers to now to the seven-digit numbers. I didn't know what the phone number was, what the three-digit prefix was. So... When I would call the operator, I'd ask for what the party was. And I said, this was the number when I left. So they had to look up what the prefix was all the way down the line for the operators down the line. So the operator had to dial the number. Well, then, like I say, the first, uh, I think the first three times I tried, we got the business signal because of the party line. So we, the guys, the 11 of us, we decided, well, let's have one last beer together. So we went to the airport lounge to have a beer together. First thing, the waitress does is ask for our IDs. So we kind of jokingly, kind of half grudgingly and jokingly, kind of giving her a little grief, you know, pull out our IDs. And with all of you were thinking, pull out our IDs, she's kind of going, 20, 20, 20, 20, 19, 20, 20, 21. Okay, only one of you is of legal age. <laughs> only one of you can have a beer. And here we were, just spent a year in Nam, but yeah, when it came home, we weren't old enough to have a beer. But if we were thinking smart, we what we should have told her was, he's really thirsty, bring him two pictures, the rest of us will have an empty glass. He's really thirsty. <laughs> but we weren't thinking fast enough. But anyway, finally, I had my ticket for Minneapolis, and they were beginning to announce boarding in Minneapolis, to Minneapolis. I was in the departure lounge here. There's a pay phone there that I'm going to try one last time. The phone rang. I thought, okay, next thing is someone going to be home because there's like a two hour time difference. Now we're now over like almost 1.30 in Seattle time. Mom answered. And the first thing I said, oh, mom, I said, what's all happening? Oh, not much. Oh, how's things going? Oh, okay. Yeah, I just thought I'd give you a call, see what's all going on. Yeah, where are you at? So she's trying to figure out which kid she's talking to. I said, oh, I'm at the airport here in Seattle. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't talk. Plane's boarding. Okay, I'll try and talk to you in Minneapolis. If I can't catch the bus, okay, bye. You click. One of my sisters told me later that the car couldn't go fast enough to get out to the field to tell Dad, hey, he's on his way home. <laughs> so, yeah, made it home that night, yeah. But 
when I got to Minneapolis there, I ran out of the baggage claim, grabbed my bag, ran out of the baggage claim, held a cab down real quick. I told the cab driver, give me the bus depot as fast as the cab could go. Uh, he did a pretty good job weaving through the traffic there. And we uh, got down to the bus depot. And uh, he parked his cab in the driveway of the uh, terminal there so no bus could leave. Until I got my ticket to make sure the bus was still there yet. And he said that the bus had left. The Minneapolis Aquitaine Parade was going to begin that night. And he'd take me to the hotel on the parade road. But in the meantime, he'd screen the buses. And uh, the bus was still there. So I, I thanked him. And my fare was six and a half dollars. I remember that from the people, air, airport to the bus, bus terminal. And I offered him a chip. And he refused to chip. And he said, that's the least I could have done for you. And he drove away. So I went back inside the terminal there and I was just standing by the door. And I was just kind of standing there. And there's something about being on that. They do not want a crowd behind them. They want them in front of them. They want nobody behind you. And a guy came up and he stood on my right side here. He's speaking very softly. And he said, you better now. My first thought was, ignore him, he'll go away. Because I was very conscious of that fact. He repeated again. You've been in now. And I thought, well, apparently he's not going to go away. So I turned to him and I looked a little bit at him. And I could see he had not shaved or changed clothes in about three or four days. So right away, I stereotyped him as a heckler. Now, before we left now, they told us about the anti war protest and uh, what was going on. And they reminded us that we were required to travel in the class A uniform. Uh, we, they told us, too, that if we were going to go out into the street, we were going to change out of it because of uh, the, the, the um, political situation. So right away, I stereotyped this guy as being a heckler. So I turned to him, and I looked at him, and I said, why are you saying that? And he said, I know you've been there. And I just said, well, how do you know that? He said, you've got that look. And I just said, what look is that? He said, the one on your face. And I said, in a very challenging and a very confrontational tone of voice, I said, yeah, so what about it then? By this time, both my fists were clenched. Every muscle in my body was tight, as tense as could be, because I thought, if he's going to hassle me about it, this guy was going to go down on the floor. We're going to settle that issue right there in that bus depot. And he sensed my uh, apprehension, and he held up both hands to me. He said, it's okay. It's okay. And he said, uh, he, he would, he, he'd been there too. Then I said, really? He goes, yeah. He asked me how long I'd been there. I said, just a couple of weeks short of one full tour. And he just shook his head. And uh, I asked him about you, about, about him, and he said, three months. I said, three months? I said, the tour is a year. He said, yeah. He said, I know. And then he wanted to tell me that uh, his infantry squad was out on the patrol. And he used a term to describe what happened to him was that he got gut shot. And he was evacuated to the hospital in Japan where he spent six months. Then he was evacuated back to the States where he, for further treatment and medically discharged. Now he was back at the Minneapolis VA. We spent the last several days there. Now he was waiting to catch a bus to go back home that, later that evening. And he said he saw me standing there. And he said he could just tell from the expression on my face that he said, this guy's been in now. He felt compelled to come over to talk to me. And uh, I was a little apprehension, apprehensive about it at first. And he said, uh, I just want to shake your hand. Uh, which I did as, as we were talking there. Then in the background, I could hear they were now calling, loading the bus to come here to Minneota. And I said, well, that's my bus. And he said, I want to shake your hand and tell you that you have a lot of courage. And so I shook his hand. I said, I wish them the best of luck. And picked up my bag and turned on. I walked out the door, got on the bus and came home. So I don't know whatever happened to him after that. So but I thought that was kind of a, a nice little ending there to that, that day there. And uh, rode the bus home. And I remember when I stopped at Marshall, I sat in the back seat because I didn't want no one behind me. I wanted everyone in front of me. But when 
bust up the marshal there, the last passengers got off. I was the only one left on it. But each mile road, I was clicking off those seats, one, two seats at a time. So we're just outside of Ghent here. By that time, I was sitting behind the driver, trying to peer out the window, trying to see, okay, now what's changed from the past year here? Couldn't see anything. So I got to town here, and when they dressed, stopped right out over here, got out there, and folks weren't around, they were late. And got my bag out then I turned around and looked and I saw him coming from coming around the corner then. So so that was coming home that night. <laughs>